Ilad has been um, working in my lab for the last um, three or so years, maybe a little before that. Um, he started out as an undergraduate and is part of our four plus one master's program. So he got his bachelor's degree from us um, last year in environmental science and technology. Um, and he has also been a College Park scholar while he was here at UMD as an undergrad. Um, he picked up a Explorers Club of Washington um, Exploration and Field Research Grant to support his work that he's going to talk to you about today, um, where he spent a lot of time um, traipsing and travailing through the urban forests of Baltimore, um, encountering all kinds of fun things like um, hornet's nests and all kinds of trash along the streams and all kinds of good stuff that you would expect in urban spaces. Um, so he's going to talk to us today about his work investigating invasive <laughs> ivy and its effects on ecosystem processes in these forest patches. Take it away, Lon. Thank you very much for the introduction, Mitch. Uh, as, as Mitch explained, I'm going to be giving my presentation on the current state of my master's thesis. It's titled Invasive Vine, Hedera Helix, or English Ivy, Impacts on Nitrogen and Carbon Cycling in Baltimore Forest Patches. So before I dive into things, I'd like to thank some people and organizations. Again, the Explorers Club Washington Group for their generous field grant, as well as the USDA MAES McIntyre Stennis Forestry Research Program grant, which has provided our lab with a lot of important funding for all the research we do. I like to thank the overall department, as well as all the resources and support I've had here, um, the PDC, people in my lab, my advisor and my committee members, Dr. Yarwood and Dr. Matthew Baker at UMBC, um, and all the labs for letting me borrow their equipment and stuff. It's really appreciated. Um, also, there's this really cool collaborative network known as the Baltimore Ecosystem Study. Um, this is a collaboration between researchers across multiple universities in the Baltimore area, primarily UMBC, um, as well as the US Forest Service and this nonprofit organization, Baltimore Green Space. Uh, this is a nonprofit focused on stewardship of all green spaces across Baltimore. Um, and they are a big part of turning like different research projects into uh, practice management. And lastly, I'd like to thank all of the people who helped me out in the field and as well as, well as in the lab, um, friends, family, roommates, and lab mates as well. So in my presentation, I'll first give you guys an introduction and background of my project going over forest patches, as well as what invasive species are, uh, the context of nitrogen and carbon in urban environments, as well as what English ivy is, how it grows, its habits, all that jazz. I'll then give you guys my research questions and the associated hypotheses. I'll go over my methodology, including plot selection, as well as sample collection and analysis of data. I'll then share some of my preliminary data. Uh, I'm still working in the lab, so I don't have everything put together, but I'll share some ecological characteristic measures, as well as some key parameters of response that I'm looking at. Lastly, I'll be going over my anticipated results um, and the implications of those results as they pertain to management as well as future steps for research. So what are urban forest patches? They are defined as having a continuous regenerative forest vegetation cover over non-impervious surfaces, so basically soil, not sidewalks and roads. Um, they are also come with the condition of having a 15 meter boundary around the forest patch, Within that 15 meter boundary is known as the forest patch core. Um, and on the left side, we have a map here of all of the different forest patch, um, all the different forest patches that are labeled in the city of Baltimore uh, that fall under this context, under this definition. Um, and on the right side, I have an example of a forest patch in Baltimore. This is not one I studied in, but this aerial photo gives a really good picture of the pressures of an urban context, that context that go into shaping an urban forest patch. Things like roads, office buildings, homes, people's lawns, all these things play a role in shaping a forest patch. All right, let's do this. So there are four key factors which influence the shape and structure of a forest patch. 
These are urbanization and global climate change, two major anthropological elements which shape forest patches as well as a more specific look at invasive species, which you might consider an anthropolo anthropological influence as well. And of course, there's the ever-present natural biotic and abiotic components, which are something you just can't avoid when you're talking about any natural system. So invasive plants. In order to understand invasive plants, you have to understand why they're considered invasive. And this is typically due to a lack of natural boundaries, things like competition, or consumers. Uh, most invasive plants come from a non-native environment and move into a space where they then lack those natural boundaries. This allows them to grow out of control and outcompete a lot of other species and dominate a system. Um, ultimately, this leads to decreased plant diversity through this out-competing out nature and dominance that they have. Um, but if you're trying to look at more of an ecosystem level impact instead of like just the plain diversity, you see a lot of variable impacts of invasive plants um, across different locations and different species. There's a lot of different findings driving the species specific and location specific research that I'm doing. So in the urban context, in order to study any plant growth, you need to understand what nitrogen, what the differences in nitrogen cycling is in, in urban spaces. So one thing that we know for sure is that there's more nitrogen in urban environments. There's this increased loading is primarily driven by lawn fertilizers as well as transportation and industrial emissions. And it's exacerbated by impervious cover, which allows nitrogen to ship all across the system rapidly and pool in specific places. The impact of this increased level of nitrogen is uh, increased competition for plant growth, allowing for more aggressive growers like invasive plants to dominate. It also leads to things like eutrophication down the line. So when stormwater ships this nitrogen out of the system, it can lead to algal blooms in water bodies. In Baltimore, we're really concerned about the Chesapeake Bay. It's right there and um, definitely heavily impacted by this nitrogen loading. Another context um, in an urban space for nitrogen that has to be understood in order to do this kind of research is that the rates of nitrogen mineralization are increasing. Um, this is a transformation from organic nitrogen forms into inorganic nitrogen forms, and it's typically followed by nitrification. Uh, these inorganic nitrogen forms are mainly ammonium, nitrite, and nitrate. Um, in contrast to organic nitrogen, which is locked in organic matter or in the soil in some other way. Inorganic nitrogen is able to be taken up by plants to encourage growth and also can be leached from the system. The drivers of this increased rate of mineralization is not, um, there's no consensus on it. Uh, a lot of people believe it's either pH driven or urban heat island effect driven, or perhaps by species invasion, including like earthworm invasion. Um, but the impacts of it are generally understood to increase the potential for the loaded nitrogen to be uptaken by plants and leave the system and pollute groundwater and stormwater. So what we're wondering here is what role can urban forest patches play in mitigating the impacts um, that are pre presented by an urban context in terms of nitrogen, but also how are they affected by this increased nitrogen load? Here I have diagrams from two different research papers trying to summarize the effects of invasive plants on nitrogen. Um, so the first thing that you'll notice, especially looking on the left in the left figure by Lau et al. 2008, is that there's just a generally increased stock of carbon across the system um, when invasive plants are involved. So from plant biomass, litter biomass, and in the soil as well. The next thing that you might notice is that there's an increased rate of nitrogen transformations. This includes mineralization and nitrification, as I already discussed. So this invasion uh, or invasion by plants exacerbates this issue in urban spaces. You also see this heavily increased rate of litter decomposition on the far left. And in the paper by Zhang et al, they identify mineralization rate as, uh, as being heavily influenced by invasive plants. Also in this right figure, you see that the effects are primarily happening through rhizosphere inputs as opposed to litter inputs. This means that 
uh, changes to the rooting space of plants are really how these invasive plants are driving these changes in the nitrogen cycle. However, you might also notice here that there's really high spread, really great uncertainty here. And this is because they're trying to summarize information from tons and tons of studies about all different types of invasive plants. Um, you can't see the variation so much on the left side, but in the text, they discuss the variability that they found in their studies. And um, it really, again, is another reason to driving for species specific studies. Now let's take a look at carbon. So everybody knows that climate change is an issue globally, but we also know that urban environments play a massive role in contributing to climate change. However, maybe urban forest patches can help alleviate that impact a little bit. Trees sequester and store uh, carbon, the older, the better. Um, and soils also store carbon longer term, the healthier, the better. And guess what? Urban forest patches have some of the oldest and uh, oldest trees and some of the healthiest soils out there in urban spaces. So preserving them can be really important for helping to mitigate climate change. We're gonna take a look back at these same review papers and the diagrams that they put together. We see really similar trends, increased carbon stocks across the board, increased rates of, nitrogen, of carbon transformation. Um, this also plays a role in litter, litter decomposition. But we see here this carbon dioxide efflux rate. This is basically soil respiration. Um, and you, you see there's a significant difference in the rate of respiration in invaded, invaded sites or invaded cases. Again, we're seeing that the effects are primarily through the rhizosphere here. And also uh, like explained a little bit better in the text, but there's tons of variability um, across all different cases of invasion. So now I'm going to give a little bit more background about what English ivy is and how it grows, because that's the start of any species specific research. We got to understand that they're native to Europe, um, as the name suggests. They're also evergreen perennial vines um, in the Aurelaceae Ariel family. I'm sorry, plant people, I messed that up. There's over 400 cultivars of them out there. They were brought to North America and all over the world as uh, ornamental plants. You see them growing on the sides of buildings and now on the sides of trees. Uh, they're probably in every single one of your yards. They are really pervasive and, you know, it's what you think of when you think of ivy. One thing about them that makes them a really great invader is that they're very, very tolerant. So they can tolerate a wide range of soil conditions, temperatures, as well as light conditions. So they prefer full sun, moist soils, um, as well as uh, temperatures in like a temperate region like our own. They can survive though in down to negative 25 degrees Celsius. And because they're evergreens, they're even growing in winter times when other plants are dormant. And they can survive in some more droughty or moist conditions in soil. They reproduce both sexually and asexually. Uh, their sexual reproduction is not the main way that they spread because their seeds are quite large and a little bit toxic. Um, so when so uh, there are some birds in Baltimore that are able to eat these seeds and spread them, but it's not their main form of, of domination. Uh, asexual reproduction is really how they overtake a system. Anytime their rooting body is making contact with the soil, they're able to proliferate and continue to grow and make new organisms and just, just keep, keep going. Urban environments are thus really, really ideal for them. There's a lot of variability, a lot of space for competition, a lot of different light fractions and soil conditions where they can take advantage. And especially in Baltimore, where we're in a temperate region, um, where a lot of plants get dormant in the winter, they really, really have this upper hand. But we don't have a really great sense of the impacts of English ivy. When we look at their effects more directly on plants, we have some things we can learn from their growth habits. So they climb up trees um, and they compete with them and they get the roots like all up in their bark, way down their branches, leading them to be more uh, exposed to perturbations like climate events and things like that. They also expose them to pathogens and herbivory through the same uh, method. Uh, they outcompete native plants for light, nutrients, water, rooting space, pretty much everything that's important to growth. 
leading to decreased growth rates and increased mortality rates of native plants. And lastly, they prevent germination. When they form dense mats on the ground, they prevent new plants from sprouting up and existing. But there's lots of gaps in the research, so we don't really know how they impact overall ecosystem function. We just know how they might impact individual plants and ultimately diversity. We also don't know what different levels of intensity of invasion might do to the system. So there's times where there's a complete monoculture of English ivy, and there's other times where there's just a couple plants on the ground. Um, and we also don't know what English ivy does in Baltimore. There's no studies out there right now observing English ivy impacts specifically in this city. This leads me to my research questions. The first one is, how does invasion by Hedera helix or English ivy impact nitrogen and carbon or nitrogen cycling in, and retention in Baltimore's forest patches? The next one is how does this vine impact carbon cycling and sequestration in Baltimore's forest patches? And finally, how are these impacts different at different degrees of invasion intensity? As a diagram kind of demonstrating how I believe the impacts of English ivy will uh, affect urban forest patches based on literature and observations in the field, I have put together this diagram um, there's a lot of complicated interactions here, but what I have shown is uh, arrows showing direction of influence with solid arrows being more uh, short term impacts and dotted arrows being longer term impacts. Um, English ivy has this ability to affect trees directly in their canopy and what litter they drop and the quality of that litter and the quantity of it. They also have the ability to affect soil in multiple um, realms and their physical, chemical, and biological components. These effects on soil and trees interact with each other over many different periods of time um, and ultimately affect the nutrient cycling in the overall system, which has some severe feedbacks back into soil health as well as into uh, tree growth. These black arrows are the questions that I'm exploring in more detail in my study. So the um, impact of English ivy directly on trees and directly on soil health, as well as the impact of litter fall on soil health and nutrient cycling and the effects of the new conditions of soil health and tree growth that impact nutrient cycling as well. Before I dive in a little bit more, I will key you guys into my anticipated results so you can think about them as we move forward. The first one is that I expect this positive correlation between invasion intensity and the rate of nitrogen mineralization. I expect therefore the same relationship between invasive uh, invasion intensity and the pool size of mineral nitrogen. I also expect a positive correlation between invasion and litter decomposition rate, but I believe this will just be um, affected by the presence of the vine and not change stepwise with increasing invasion intensity. And I expect that same relationship for soil respiration rate. The opposite relationship is expected for soil carbon to nitrogen ratio. Um, so when you go from a uh, no invaded site, uh, an uninvaded site to an invaded site, the carbon to nitrogen ratio is expected to drop, but this is not expected to change with invasion intensity. And lastly, looking at canopy cover, I expect there to be this negative correlation between invasion intensity and the cover um, in the canopy. So more, more gap for light to come through. Moving into my methodology. I'd like to start by explaining how I selected plots. So I received this massive data set of 869 plots across 47 forest patches in Baltimore, put together by the Baltimore Ecosystem Study, uh, given to me by my a committee member, Dr. Matthew Baker. Um, and this does a really great job of characterizing urban forest patches and understanding their form and how we define them. Our lab is taking this data and trying to um, shift it into a discussion about how urban forest patches function and the services that they're able to provide and how those uh, services change with different pressures. So I took this data set and I cleaned it up and 
narrowed it down uh, by based on two different aspects, primarily the Schumacher index and percent ground cover. The Schumacher index is this uh, index which a lab or a, a, a graduate student of Matthew Baker's put together a couple of years ago. It is not a published index, but it is extremely useful for defining how vines affect trees or how heavily invaded a tree is. So on an individual tree, you, you uh, rank how, how intensely invaded it is from zero being no invasion, one being just around the trunk of the tree, all the way up to five, which would be a complete cover of the trunk and the canopy. I compared this with percent ground cover at each plot. And I, I gave the condition that um, every site had to have a ground cover of at least 20% English ivy in order to expect that the Schumacher index is due to invasion by English ivy and not some other vine. I then went out into the field and actually visited all of these plots and narrowed down my selection. I did this based on signs of management of the vines. I did this also based on position in a riparian zone or along an edge of the forest patch. If I saw there's a lot of light coming through because there's simply no canopy because the plot is along the edge, I would remove the site. Also, if there's presence of trash, I would remove the site as well. In the end, I selected 20 different plots, each measuring 3.05 square meters across three different forest patches in Baltimore. And these were grouped into four groups, control, low, medium, and high invasions. So five, plots for each of those treatments. All of these plots are positioned in the Piedmont Plateau. All the soils are either loams or silt loams, and they're primarily stony. They all have similar hydrology and they face similar urban pressures. This is uh, a map of, so on the left side, you see a map of my, of the forest patches that I was working in. So top left, I guess, Northwest Baltimore, you have Fendel, which is the rough of a golf course. Sinai, uh, this is Sinai Hospital. There's a forest patch that surrounds one of their buildings. And then Johns Hopkins University. Let's take a closer look at this figure so you guys can see um, it in better detail. So this is the spread of plots across each forest patch labeled by what control group they fell under. So I separated these Schumacher and indexes using the natural breaks feature of uh, ArcGIS. Um, and then I laid them out on and um, I laid them out into the forest patch here and labeled them based on what invasion intensity they fall under. You also can see the urban pressures that surround each of these plots. There's lawns and other green spaces, as well as a lot of roads and buildings and homes, which all play a role. Um, I would like to note that some of these plots actually look closer to the stream than they actually are. They're just th like th just three square meters. So those are not quite on the riparian zone. So you guys can get a better picture of what a plot really looks like. Um, this is one of my plots with two of my volunteers, my father on the left side and Chen Yao from our lab on the right side. Um, those orange flags all the way to the left and all the way to the right are two of the corners of the plot and the other two are behind me. Um, and each corner faced a cardinal direction. So now I'm going to be going into how I collected my samples and what I did with them. So the first thing is canopy and leaf litter. On the left side, you see this pretty sick photo of, uh, it's called a hemispherical canopy photo. I went out at dawn and dusk times and took pictures with a fisheye lens from a standard height at about breast height, maybe a little lower, um, and took pictures of the canopy facing upwards. Uh, the, and change the exposure slowly in order to get a really good contrast of sky to canopy. I will then be able to run these through different computer programs, which will analyze the gap fraction and the number of gaps and things like that in the canopy. This will be a really great ecological characteristic tool um, in order to compare the impact of that invasion has directly on canopy coverage. And it can also be used to um, compare other more key parameters. Um, against, against canopy coverage and look for drivers. On the right side, this is an example of how I collected my litter. Um, so I placed these half square meter boxes at random places inside of the plot. I had four of them. I first took the depth of the litter using a standard ruler, and then I collected all the leaf litter from the surface of the, of, um, the forest floor. 
I waited until all the litter had fallen. So this is out in like December, I wanna say. And then I combined all four of these samples and ground them and we'll submit them for analysis for total carbon and total nitrogen to determine if there's if this is a significant impact on the nitrogen and carbon cycling, if like litter, if the litter content is really much different in invaded sites. These are two examples of some in situ measurements that I took of uh, soil chemistry or soil uh, characteristics. On the left side, Ben Robinson right there um, is taking a measurement of unsaturated hydraulic conductivity using a mini disc infiltrometer. I placed three of these around each plot at random locations inside of the plot. And uh, you put a certain amount of water in there uh, and you take a measurement of the water every 30 seconds as it infiltrates into the soil through a porous disc. I'm able to get a infiltration curve from this and extrapolate an unsaturated hydraulic conductivity rating at each plot. This is important for uh, determining if this is either a um, confounding variable for some of the key parameters or if it is actually driven by invasion intensity. On the right side, these are temperature data loggers. I planted one of these at each plot at six centimeters deep. And they were in there for several months collecting temperature data um, every 30 minutes. So a little bit more about how I got my soils and what I did with them. On the left side, this is me taking a soil sample using a core hammer device. Um, I took four soil samples per plot, each about a half meter from each corner of the plot using this device. Um, the eastmost sample was reserved for bulk density measurements because you have to have a known volume to get that, which is also a, a characteristic measure as well. Um, other characteristic measures I took from these soil samples are pH, water content using gravimetric water content methodology, as well as soil organic matter. Um, I also will analyze these samples for total carbon and total nitrogen to get a similar measure as I would for the litter total carbon and total nitrogen. And finally, I will get a mineral nitrogen content for each of these plots, which I think will be a key parameter in order to determine how invasive plants alter nutrient cycling. On the right side, you see me hammering this PVC pipe into the ground. This was used to incubate soil for one month in situ and compare the mineral nitrogen content of this incubated sample to the fresh soil sample. Getting these two, comparing these two, you can um, extrapolate a nitrogen mineralization rate. And um, so I extracted mineral, the mineral nitrogen content from each of these samples at each time step um, using uh, a strong salt. <laughs> Going into a little bit more of the nutrient method, nutrient sample collection methodology I used. On the right side is this really cool um, method called the T-bag index. Um, I, this is collecting data on the fine litter decomposition rate. So I buried two arrays of two different kinds of tea. Uh, one was green tea, which represents the labile fraction of fine litter. And the one was rooibos tea, which represents the woody fraction of fine litter. These were buried in these arrays and collected in different time steps after being pre-weighed. I collected one set after, or one set of four tea bags from each group after one month, another set after two months, another set after four months. I dried these and reweighed them and was able to get the decay rate from this, which would represent the fine litter decomposition rate. On the right side, I, you see this EGM-5 carbon dioxide analyzer. This is used to get an instantaneous measurement of the respiration rate at each plot. Only one sample was taken per plot, but all across the pretty much the same weekend, the same time frame. And this is just uh, one glance at how soil respiration works at invaded versus control sites. Now I'll be talking about how I'm actually going to analyze this data. So I use Excel and R, or, and I am still using Excel and R for most of my uh, data processing. The first step is getting mean values of each parameter. Um, I wanna remind you of the key response parameters I'm concerned about. So this is canopy cover, the carbon to nitrogen ratio of soil, the nitrogen mineralization rate, as well as the mineral nitrogen pool size, the soil respiration rate, and fine litter decomposition rate. In order to analyze the relationship between invasion intensity 
and these key response parameters, I'm running ANOVA testing or ANOVAs um, to find initial correlation between these, this, uh, this control variable and these res response variables. The next step is to, to determine if there's any confounding variables present. This means running new tests, which tests which block by things like forest patch, pH, soil temperature, and other characteristic measurements to see if these are the true drivers of the relationship instead of it being due to invasion intensity. And finally, once, I, once I've made all these determinations, I'll use post hoc and so hypothesis testing to get the significance, strength, and direction of relationships and make my final conclusions. Now I'd like to share some of the preliminary data that I've grabbed so far. As you can see here, I have uh, data on bulk density. So there is no correlation between invasion intensity and bulk density. This p-value is close to significant, but not quite there. And regardless, the group which is different is the low level invasion. So it's likely that this is just due to randomness in the, in the sample and not any actual relationship. Soil pH, however, does have a significant difference uh, across groups. Um, you can see visually that this is a positive relationship and the p-value is below 0.05. However, once I ran a two keys significant difference test, uh, like this post hoc test, um, I didn't find any significant difference, differences between individual groups, which is unfortunate, but visually you can see there's kind of this stepwise increase. And hopefully if there was a higher sample size, I would actually be able to um, prove this relationship to be significant. Next, graphic metric water content with a massive p-value. This has no correlation with invasion intensity whatsoever, but is again, an important ecological characteristic measure. Uh, we can check for, for it as a confounding variable. And next we have one of the key response variables. So this is soil respiration rate and the p-value is not significant, but again, let's take a look at the visuals here. So uh, it seems that there is a positive relationship between presence of the vine and, um, and soil respiration rate. There's this jump from the control group to the other groups, but there doesn't seem to be a significant difference between low, medium, and high invasion intensities. However, again, we can't really make this a statistically significant finding. And next we're looking at that tea bag study. So this is fine litter decomposition rate, um, the labile fraction and the woody fraction. So there's no significant finding here on the, in the labile fraction, but in the woody, you see this more clo close to significant relationship between invasion presence and the rate at which these, this fine litter is decomposing. Um, again, this looks similar to the soil respiration rate box plot. So you're seeing a, a big change between control and the invaded sites, but not much change, or at least not much of a change that it, you would expect to see. Like there's a bit of a step down, which is likely again due to randomness and a low sample size. Um, but it appears that invasion presence might be making this change. And hopefully this could be proven with a higher sample size in a different study. Now I'm just gonna remind you guys of these anticipated results that I went over earlier let you look at it for a bit, soak it in. Um, and now let's look at that relationship that we just checked out in the preliminary data. So I had expected there to be this presence impact, which would drive change in litter decomposition rate and soil respiration rate. We're not able to prove these anticipated results, but we do have suggestion that they might be true and might be able to be proven in other studies. Assuming that all my anticipated results were in fact true, I'd like to talk about the implications of my findings. Ultimately, they would imply that there is poor nitrogen retention and poor carbon sequestration in forest patches in plots which are invaded by English ivy. This would lead to things like further plant invasion by, by uh, increasing the amount of nitrogen, the mineral nitrogen available for plants to uptake, uh, increasing the competition for growth. It would also increase the likelihood of nitrogen polluting stormwater and groundwater by being available to be washed away. And it would also increase or decrease the ability of urban forest patches to mitigate climate change. What does this mean for managers though? 
So uh, I've been working with Baltimore Green Space. They're part of this Baltimore Ecosystem Study Collaboration Network, um, and they're kind of the uh, actualizers here. So they um, bring volunteers together from different communities to get interested in protecting their urban forest patches and other green spaces. And they also pull together researchers to um, drive forward the improvement of the health of urban forest patches. So this would help instruct them on when to allocate resources in order to remove English ivy, because it is a completely pervasive vine that can't be eradicated, and they can't just go kill, kill, kill all the time. It would be a never-ending cycle. It would also help them um, with grant applications. So in Maryland and Baltimore especially, we're really concerned about stormwater. And if I'm able to prove that English ivy increases the amount of nitrogen that's being exported to water bodies, especially the Chesapeake Bay, and is causing eutrophication in these water bodies, it'll help them apply for grants and get more money to uh, go fix up their forest patches. And lastly, what I want to see in future studies. Um, so I think it would be really interesting to get a more specific look at how English ivy impacts um, the system through what pathways. So taking a closer look at how litter inputs might impact the nutrient cycling versus rhizosphere inputs, what exudates are coming out of the roots and causing or stimulating the microbial community to be so aggressive, let's say. Um, I would also like to see a study uh, comparing invasion specifically in trees versus ground cover, because this picture on the bottom right, you see it's completely covered in English ivy on the ground, but this is actually a low level intensity invasion site because there's hardly anything growing in the trees. We have the exact opposite up here. So these trees are completely covered. This is a high level invasion intensity site, but there's no uh, English ivy growing on the ground here. And I think that there would be significant differences in their effects. And this is not something that I um, put into my method design or my study design. And finally, I want to encourage other researchers to in invasive species research to do species specific and location specific studies of all different kinds of invasive plants. Um, because I think this is really the next step forward in getting a better picture of how invasion affects our world. These are my references. Thank you very much. And any questions? We have time for questions, but I'll remind everyone that around 1230, you all received a uh, link to the evaluation to your email. And I would encourage you to complete that uh, for your last. Uh, seminar today, but uh, questions a great lot. Dr. Mullins. Too, I love your work, Bob. I'm Thank super you. Super excited about it, and it has a lot of implications for mine that a lot of people might not connect. So, my first question is: Do you ever think that we might see invasion that you came across in the picture that actually is better for sequestration and better for water infiltration? Yeah, there's this really great paper. Um, I can send it to you. It's by Tasten and Cole. I don't remember the year. I think maybe 2015. And they discuss how we like have vilified invasive species kind of just broad stroke and we don't really consider the overall impacts of them. So this is really the importance of the species specific study. They suggest, and there's been some suggestions in other literature papers that um, because there's just so much more growth in an invaded site, they're perhaps maybe storing more nutrients inside of them. The converse of that and the reason why it's not like accepted yet, of course, there needs to be a lot more research, is because usually they're a shorter term holder of this of this nutrients, especially vines, um, not English ivy so much because it's a, it's a evergreen, but things like porcelain berry, you know, they grow really fast, they take up all this nitrogen and carbon, and then they just drop it all off, it gets decomposed really rapidly, and then all of it just gets shipped out of the system. Yeah, so I mean, like stilt grass goes all over ours, and I always think like the vilifying, that's the perfect word, and I mean, there's reason for that, but I think it's interesting the species-specific look that we need to take. And then the second quick question, so in all of my urban, suburban wildlife work, what we're finding is that these green patches are it. Like, this is where all the biodiversity is mm -hmm. and maintained. And forest cover has been a number one leak. And I'm wondering, like, if you were interested in using, so 
So the only way the District of Columbia gets money to do wildlife management is from their state wildlife action plan. And to do that, they have to link it to kind of ecosystem services, right? Mm -hmm. And so now we're talking about all the ecosystem services of DC. And I had a PhD student who just defended that showed all of those ecosystem services of water storage and what have you come from these small earth yeah. and green patches. Mm -hmm. And so if you're interested in going down that road, what do you think the next step for the research, trying to tie it directly to modeling ecosystem services would be? Um, so a lot of times what we're doing now, and this is actually Mairead's work in our lab, um, she's modeling the impacts of different best management practices on stormwater regulation. This is like urban forest patches are not necessarily considered a best management practice. So I would expect there to be a lot of potential for building models, um, specifically targeting urban forest patches. I think that's like a really good idea. Um, modeling is not something I have experience in or have explored yet. But I think like that same type of relationship and those same kinds of models could totally be applied to urban forest patches. It's just a lot more complex because they're shaped by more factors and they're not constructed per se. So you can't just like, but you know, that being said, this, this great data set that the Baltimore ecosystem study put together has everything, you know, it has elevation and slope and landform and edge patch characteristics and shape. Um, so I think there's a, a lot of data out there and there needs to be more, but the model could definitely be built. It might have to be city specific though, uh, or at least regions. So DC and Baltimore, you know, maybe could use the same model. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So Eli, do you refer to this in your sort of last model, but or this discussion that in some cases, these are like blanketing the forest floor. Right. And in other cases, they're climbing up and covering the trees. And this sort of fits with sort of some of my own observation, limited observations mm -hmm. of English ID that sometimes they're climbers and sometimes they're yeah. not. Do you think this is controlled by differences among these like 400 varieties that you made reference to mm -hmm. that really sort of tied into the particular, you know, the, the genetics of the plants or are they more driven by the environmental circumstances that sort of force them up or out? Sure. So I think based on what I saw in the field, um, I didn't do any species or cultivar assessment, but I would expect it to mostly be driven by what cultivars are growing in what places. But certain cultivars are going to do better in different places. So uh, there's a, if there's a lot of slope, one might be more successful and that one might prefer ground cover. And that's something I saw. So in uh, plots which had a steeper slope, there's perhaps more ground cover. Plots where there is, um, or not plots specifically, but just walking around, you see more ground cover in edge spaces as well. So maybe when they have a lot of light access right directly on the forest floor, um, those cultivars, or maybe just any English ivy, would just take advantage of the sun that's available right there instead of climbing a tree looking for sun. Um, I've lived in the same house for 30 years. There's been ivy around. Last three years, it's gone crazy. Um, and just some people, I've got at least 10 vines grow up to the gutter now in my house. Oh, wow, yeah. And they've all been ripped down. I've got trees. If you go by the forest, you can see tree after tree just totally taken over by ivy. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what changed in the last three years? Because that, that, that wouldn't happen for 27 years before that. I started studying these and they started to act up. That's <laughs> right. Did you do something to do it then? Or? Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah. Or something you threw out or something? Yeah, I'm really, I mean, it could be, I, 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 could, I really couldn't do it. Global warming, warmer temperatures. I, I'm just curious, because mm -hmm. it, like I said, I've lived there 30 years, it's never been a problem. There's been one patch of ivy growing on the ground, and it's actually, it's 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 one of the few patches that haven't gone crazy. But everywhere mm -hmm. in the woods, it's taking over every damn tree in the woods, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I can't say for sure. Uh, you know, is there, maybe your, your neighbor started fertilizing their lawn. Um, you know, maybe... Maybe it's just a, a result of increased temperatures. You know, I mean, there's always been some ivy there. There's some vines that are bigger than my arm. Yeah, that have been there for 20 years. But they're more but, dormant. But it didn't take over all the other trees. So, what what were the cicadas like in your? Oh, interesting question. Oh, we had cicadas. A lot. Huh? Deafening or? I don't, I don't know what the deafening level is. Okay. <laughs> you can hear the little yeah, bastards. Did you smell them? <laughs> Because there, so there's been some studies that have shown that 
infiltration rates are different in heavily invaded cicada areas in the last three years. Mm -hmm. And there's also shifts in food webs. So it's possible that there were some release of the ivy from something. Like I noticed there's less deer in our yard the last two years because of like those shifts around. So maybe there's less browsing. I mean, I just, I just thought yesterday I'm going to get the roundup up and spray because it was going to take my whole damn house over. Yep. Like, yeah. It'll be the wooded cottage, you know, without the yep. wood. Adele? I love the great presentation. Thank you. Yeah, I was wondering, so you were taking the camera of the uh, gap, you know. Oh, yeah. So I had yeah, the yeah, right. I, was, I was just wondering really if you had access to drones. Uh, oh. Could you get a canopy? Kind of sort of, you know, density, leaf area index and so forth. And mm -hmm. even with the senses, proper senses, maybe isolation of different species mm -hmm. to some extent, you know. So Dr. Matthew Baker is actually starting to work on some drone, stu drone or studies using drones um, to analyze. Uh, I think they're working specifically at the UMBC campus. And I don't know if they're focusing on in invasive species specifically, but you know, using a combination of drones and lidar data, there's like some really, really interesting stuff out there. Um, there's also another way to take this canopy cover data is using like a, um, I guess a, I want to call it like a light wand. There's there's a word. What what is the name of that? Yeah, like, canopy meter, mm -hmm. digital canopy meter that the same calculates leaf area index. Right. So it cal so you would take a measurement um, at the forest floor and you would then take it above the canopy and take another measurement above and get a comparison that way. Um, but those are really useful for agricultural systems where the canopy is like right here. And in a forest patch, like trying to get a stable pole that goes all the way up high is not, is not so realistic. That's not, that's not satellite imagery though. So excellent. Thank you. So, <laughs> right. Um, so I'm biological controls. I don't think there's any anything substantial out there for vine control using biological controls. Uh, goats have been suggested, and that works well for Phragmites. I know. Um, I'm not sure. I'm sure that they'd anything. It it would probably work for the ground cover. Um, but really, I think the key that I'm trying to help the managers with is like knowing what level of invasion is problematic. So just just doing targeted attacks um, on vines. So usually just cutting out the base is how a lot of managers go about it. Um, the, the heavier vines on trees. It's really hard to strip the vines off the trees even once they're dead. But taking maybe a little bit more of a targeted approach at that could have could have some helpful benefits as well. And and a lot because like the vines just stay dead on the trees and they're still like covering up um growth. So it wouldn't go well with most of us if we got six goats. Say it again. It would go with big in the neighborhoods if we got like six. Oh goats yeah, yeah. Now you'd have to like take like watch them closely, <laughs> keep make a little fence, take them home with you. Daniel? Yeah, I you talked that you were and what about one of your hypotheses that um you didn't anticipate like a stepwise increase of I think it was yeah better decomposition rate. Mm -hmm. uh, could you talk a little bit more about why you started that? Sure. So um the thing about English IV is that it's an evergreen. So the it's not actually inputting um nitrogen or through or it's not putting its leaves into the litter. Instead, it's like kind of maybe restricting what trees are growing and thus impacting the litter that they're dropping, but they're not themselves um, dropping litter. So I wouldn't expect that more and more in, um, invasive vines to, to change that because they're, they're the, they are plants with a really low carbon to nitrogen ratio compared to other plants. Um, and this is the way that a lot of invasive vines drive this, this relationship. Things like porcelain berry, you know, they drop their leaves and that has an effect. Uh, I do expect there to be a relationship, though, maybe not driven by the invasion presence, but um, just correlated with it because you're just having a more nitrogen in the system compared to how much carbon there is. I mean, more carbon also helps growth, but nitrogen is usually the limiting factor. And having uh, more nitrogen in the system is 
gonna both draw is gonna drive the invasion in the first place. I hope that was an adequate answer. I think we need to call this part to an end.